Well, I've heard stories about that uh, Live Aid uh, recently. Like one guy I thought who, who totally killed it was Howard Jones. You know, he's just out there by himself playing piano since he was 70. And I thought some other acts, I was like, who, who was that? Howard Jones. Oh, yeah. He was popular at that time, wasn't he? Yeah. And there's some other bands where I was like, well, maybe they should have warmed up a little bit backstage first. You know? So it was like hit and miss. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and then, uh, you know, after. After that, uh, I don't. I don't even want to talk about these years. Not the pretenders to me, but did you after the Blair thing? When you're supporting U2, were you back in at that time? I apologize for not remembering because I went to a call L.A. Coliseum with U2. And no, was, I wasn't. I wasn't around at that period. Johnny that was more, actually in the band. Yeah, right? yeah. I was. Uh, I was on a hiatus. Yeah, that's why it wasn't as memorable. That's why I bought more U2 merch that day. I think. Yeah. There you go. Um, hey, I saw your uh, I saw the postcard song that you posted. It's very pretty. Yeah, that was a, a last minute thing because I I I'd written a song about that subject matter, getting these uh, experiences with uh, people that were no longer around. And um, Jimmy and Peter have, have done this to me over the years. Less so now, of course, but quite amazing things happened and. Um, I felt I had to get that across, and um, that was the song. There were a lot of people talking loud and stuff. It's acoustic. Please, there's places at the back for talking. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but I didn't want to stop. I almost did, but mm -hmm. basically we recorded it anyway, and uh, uh, a photographer friend of mine brought a camera, so it's like almost one camera, I think. But but I can't get over how well I put the vocal over because. It's very a vulnerable vocal track, and I'm no vocalist. I've done mm -hmm. backing vocals all my life, but to to write and perform your song, that was the first time I've ever done that. So, you know, it, it got your attention. It got your ass's attention, too. Yeah. And so it's like, it's a great thing, and that's the thing in music, whatever it is. Challenge yourself. Doesn't matter. Challenge yourself continually. And you be you can surprise yourself. You can fall flat on your face, mm -hmm. but do it, do it. Otherwise, you never get anywhere. You don't feel. So I'm I'm glad I got I got that together. Got a mix done. My friend Paul Cobble did the mix, and my friend Alan Bailey uh, edited it to, together. Because there is an edit in the middle of that where I just carried on going. I could play this all night, you know. In other <laughs> words, shut the fuck up. But there was no reaction, so I just went straight into the the next half of the song and. Um, yeah, it was a tribute. There were a lot of problems attached because Paul Cheshire, who knew J Jimmy, who was playing Jimmy's favorite guitar from before he really was in bands from a music shop. And he was there with that, but he didn't make it because his knee went. So I had to rehearse that that afternoon yeah. with the guys that actually played, uh, played the, you know, da, 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 da. that little theme that creeps in. That's the whole point of the song. It's just remembering yeah, that time because you know I still the lyric is uh, where I still sit today. Where I you sit on a drum kit as a drummer, mm -hmm. you look at the band, and you look at the audience. The singer can't do that. No. All they can do is look at the audience most of the time because they're singing to them, they're selling the song, yeah. and the rest of the time on guitar solo she can watch James and have a look at me and you know. But for me, it's never the same. That guy there to my left, that's Jimmy and that's Pete. Yeah. Because they're facing the audience too. And I, those two positions, and there are things in different songs from those days I still remember. When Chrissy sings this line, I look at Jimmy and go like, and say this, and he knows what I'm saying. It's Those things never leave because you're in the same place. This, I'm looking at the same ass that I've looked at for 40 <laughs> odd years. And, you know... It, it's just a different, a different uh, space, you know. And and you know, it's, it's they're still in my life. I love them to death. I always did. They're my best mates. 
and they've been gone like 38 years or something, Jimmy. Yeah, yeah. 38 years uh, coming up in a few days. I was crushed. I was in shock. I mean, I remember it was like it was yesterday. It's nuts. I, was, it's, I couldn't that be. Means, yeah, that means he would be 63. <laughs> he would be coming up to 63 <laughs> years old in November. Wow. He was 25 when he died. Way ahead of his time. Playing like Oh yeah, I mean, you know, we had plans to to be in bands and be and produce albums with other people, do the Pretenders, and uh, we would have had a great band, me and Jimmy. What? Um, no question. I haven't found any tunes. Um, what was what was the sound of Cheeks? What did that sound like? That was uh, C3 driven, at extreme volume, mm -hmm. so it was pretty hairy. Um, some of the songs were okay, uh, and it was Verdon from Mont the Hoople, so I knew Verdon, and uh, we did that for, I don't know how long, four years or something, but nothing really happened, yeah. and um, Jimmy was the first to get out of that, and then I was the last one living in the van in London. Gotcha. Um, you still have any of those demos lying around? Did you record them? I've got a single. We did a single for, um, oh, what was the name of the record company? But uh, I've got that single. That's all we did on the rebound was the song. Yeah. Uh, but you know, we, it was good. It was a good time. But I, we never made any money at all. I never had a penny and ended up in the van, living near the Nashville rooms in West Kensington for about a year and a half on my own. <laughs> wow. Incredible commitment and then, stupidity. And it all turned. Magic happened. You met the right folks. Yeah, you got to be committed. I mean, that's challengers about. and meet constantly meet people. Right. That's, you got to network, man. You got to network, and uh, I've never been good at networking. I got to say. I mean, I, I see lots of people. I never ask for numbers. I never stayed. You know, it's just I don't know what it is about me. It's all right. I'm, I'm a shy guy myself, but I do know the importance. Oh yeah. Like in, in more than talent, more than it's like if you're in the right place and you're not a jerk. And so you get calls. It just happens. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've heard a few of the new tunes. Um, I think Chrissy's voice sounds the same. Like, it's so yeah. good. Like, it's great, uh, isn't it? I think it sounds better. She's got a she's got a better delivery than she's ever had. She, she's got the experience. Uh, she was never really a natural front person. She's had to learn to do that. Sure. Uh, and uh, but she's she's good at it now. I mean, she's. She's too cool for school, you know. She's pretty damn good. She knows um, she knows how to do it. She knows the technique. Super loud in the mix. Most yeah, of the you know, that's the way of a great vocalist. They do that so you can't hear the tom toms. You know, <laughs> it's great. But the thing is, if I could find anybody better to work with, I'd work with them. Yeah. My one of my singers in a really aggressive rock band I was in uh, called Vendetta Red. He always used to tell me, <laughs> "Enough with the cymbals. You're making my teeth hurt." So, yeah. Like, mm, they get a little more dynamic, yeah. Yeah, I do like to go a period without hitting the cymbal just to keep tension. That's really what it is. It releases tension, and it's kind of good to just... Because very often I'll hit a cymbal, but it's a, it's just a... Yeah. I don't I don't really hit it bang right at the cymbal. Just, just, little, just to bring a little shimmer of sound into it, you know? Uh, it's almost like a drum echo. That's that kind of thing, and you can gradually build up, you know. And so there's it's there's cool. always to use symbols. That's why um, uh, you know the symbols are the, the main part of the setup because you want to create this this uh, soundscape and this uh, you know spectrum in in the song. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's incredible the difference i can't go on the road with higher kits anymore i've done that and it's just awful the kit doesn't sound right the symbols are crap and it's just you can't portray the song so i don't do that anymore yeah do you still uh i saw you once in the 90s i think you were playing behind plexiglass do you still do that you, you hate it i bet yes it's been the bane of my life because <laughs> it's the, it's the symbols mainly going down a vocal mic um, into chris's ears and i get that yeah so that's the way it's been but to have it directly at me at 90 degrees means i get a reflection of sound so it makes the drum kit louder mm -hmm. and i get a reflection of me where's the audience all i can see is the backdrop with me in the middle of it and it's just bullshit 
So we're, we've changed that. We're going to get these little wraparound things around the symbols because that's really the bit. The other thing is terrible is I used to love standing in the center, 10 feet from the stage, and you can hear the vocals and the band here and coming directly out of their amps and from the drum kit acoustically. That's critical to get a great sound. That's why you can't watch rock and roll in a, in a stadium. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you can watch it, but you can't hear it. Yeah. You know, really, the ideal thing is a really good club. The world headquarters in Austin, Texas, was one of the greatest. A couple of thousand people, bars all down the side and a stage everybody can see. Fantastic. Yeah, what I consider my audition for the Duff Band was halftime at a Seattle Seahawks game. So there's, you know, 60,000 people and it's like, it's so hard to it's reflective get isn't it? out of that. Like everyone is a hundred yards away from every direction and you're rolled out in the middle of the field. It's tough. Have you ever tried the symbol tape? The, um, I've tried that a few times on tour. It's like the specific symbol tape you put on the bottom of the symbols. That works pretty well too, in case you didn't really? want to put everything around the symbol. Yeah. No, it, you've got to play symbols properly. There's a lot of expression with symbols and different symbols. So your symbol setup, you look at people like Keltner, and mm. what he's got, all just so. And I don't know if you've sat on many pe different people's drum kits like Kelton. You sit in Keltner's seat. Yeah. He was doing a Clapton session. And they invited me over and I went in and I sat on his kit. Can I sit? Yeah, sure. Sat on his kit and everything was in its place. You could just tell. This is great. Everything you need is. And, mm. and Jim has great wrist action. Uh, he's very delicate. He has a beautiful touch. And that's that's Jim. I mean, he's. He's the best of the best, you know, that's why he's used so often. And um, yeah, it's interesting. I sat on many people's drum kits and you feel like the drummer. You really do. You can play those licks that that is the drummer's lick, you know. Right. Yeah, I can see that. I don't know. Um, I should have sat on Charlie's when we did some tours with the Stones. I wanted to sit on Charlie's. I never, I never got up the gumption to ask him. He would have let me no problem. He put a table and chair and an ashtray and drinks and stuff behind Keith's amp once, just so I could sit on the stage with the Stones and watch him. Yeah. He kept looking at me, going and pointing at pointing at at, uh, at Keith, going like, you know, it's great fun. It is a privilege to play with uh, with great bands. I must have been on on the road and meet all these people. It's been a, a bit of a charm life in many respects. You're still here, and I'm really happy about that. Um, so far, so good. <laughs> yeah, as far as other people's drum, I did a uh, I did a benefit for recovery a few years ago in L.A. for Jerry Cantrell of Alice in Chains. Yeah. Of Music Cares benefit and. There was always there was um, Billy Idol and me and Duff and Loaded played and Moby was the DJ. Yeah, uh, so it was good. play like, all these uh, and then but we were going to be the backup band for the Wilson Sisters of Heart and we didn't really even rehearse we just showed up in their motel room and we sat yeah. around and I played on my lap you know while they're trying to yeah. work out. we were doing an Elton John cover and uh, anyway I get to the actual show the next day and there's Allison Chain's kit and Billy Idol's kit and all these people and they're like you don't you don't get to play a kit you got to play on one of these and I was like and I knew Sean from Allison Chain's and he's like yeah just play my kit dude just like don't move stuff around too much mm. we sound check with that and then a few hours later the sound the the sound lead sound engineer goes no 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 we want that we don't want to move that you got to play on the Billy Idol kit now yeah. which is like go. a giant bass drum totally different levels and it's like and you can't move anything and i was like i'm not gonna play with for the wilson sisters on a kit that's i can't touch no but, other musician any other musician play anything else they bring their own guitar yeah. they plug in they kind of fiddle with it a bit to get a bit of a sound and that's that they're on the same instrument yeah drummers just deal with it monitor yeah. probably out of whack you know you just got to you gotta, yeah, you uh, just gotta you gotta deal with it exactly, and you can't play what you want to play because the highest too low, low, and you can't get that swing yeah. in there. And where's the hell? You know, you're constantly looking for things to hit that sound somewhere near what you want to expect yeah. to hear. You know, and my it's, playing, it's, it's playing, I've never played with the, the sisters before. Like, I don't want any dirty looks. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, it's again, it's like, hey, challenge yourself. Yeah. It's not the end end of the world. Just do the part and. Uh, and try it. It's interesting to try and ad adapt and adjust to what 
the instrument you're playing at the moment. It's difficult to do because it's all separate. It's all journeys. Playing the drums, any other instrument, piano, a yeah. harp, a guitar, a saxophone, they're small movements. Yeah. Okay, there's Pete Townsend, but he didn't have to do that. <laughs> um, but you know what I mean? With a, with a drum kit? Yeah. My catchphrase is the greatest drummers don't know what they're doing. You don't even think about it. Right. It's purely coming from your emotional, hearing that vocal, hearing that change of core. Whoa. And so that journey that you begin, your arm's going over here because you decided you're going to whack somebody over there. That right. journey is called feel, a natural feel. And it that's, could every night, show to show. Yeah. That's the fun. That's what it is. It's a unique instrument. I have one practice kit here where I purposely set it up difficult. I yeah. check the toms in a weird direction. Some of them have holes, jagged cymbals, right. uh, extra heavy bass drum, just so like I'm prepared for anything because something's always going to go wrong. So I practice on that one all the time. So when I get on my regular kit, it's just like butter, you know. You know Sod's law. They call it Sod's law. Everything, you know, at some point, something's going to go wrong, you know. Mm -hmm. And I, I live like that. It's like, what's next? Is, I think Dave, Dave Stewart called it the paradise syndrome. Mm, paradise. Everything's great. What's going to go wrong? Because <laughs> we've always been on, we've been on tour before where we see certain bands or certain drummers and they're like, everything's got to be perfectly locked and and placed or I'm not going to play. Like, it's got to be... Mm. Uh, and in guitars too, I've run into that before. It's like everything. It's like I'm not sure how long you guys have been on tour. Like stuff's gonna go wrong, you know. It's gonna well, be I only have one thing that I must do. If we get a new lighting designer, uh, and we turn up for sound check of the first gig, or I meet him or whatever, and I say hi, I'm Martin. Uh, I only got one thing to say. He says, "What's that?" I said, um, "I don't play any good in the dark." <laughs> you yeah. know, yeah. it's like. You know, I, I it's I'm I'm not a backing band person, you know. Yeah. You, you're in the dark all the time. You, you're your best lighting trick. I always love that backlight, you know, time the Avenger. It's just mm -hmm. a silhouette. It's so powerful. It's just a silhouette. It's so awesome. Yeah. Yeah. You can do a lot with silhouettes, but I, I want people to see what I'm up to because there's always something going on. Mm -hmm. You know, I might find a snake on the bass drum or something at one point, you know, playing in Arizona or something a rattler or something you never know that was just like that <laughs> <laughs> they hit it they hit it in the bass drum it's slithering up someone someone pulled a joke on you can't stop playing keep playing the song don't stop yeah you were super, super that'd be good to call over your drum tech oh over here because they they're looking at you so they come straight over i was like get rid of that rattlesnake would you <laughs> <laughs> it's your job do your job get the rest yeah. out of here yeah. But what I pay you for? Am I taking? <laughs> Get the snake re removal kit. What do you mean you haven't got one? Oh, uh, here come the pretenders. Uh, they're the ones with the snakes. It's, uh, we need extra hands on the stage. Yeah, you it's a um, is there anything you wanted to plug that you know that's happening coming up for the new record? that I don't, which I don't know a lot. Not really. I, I did put it in that we should do some sort of podcast and play selections off the new album. Um, you know, once things are settling back in a bit better before we can go out and play gigs. Um, but I don't know. I, I, I really have nothing to do with the band at all, yeah. apart from I do what I can, whatever's needed to make the band sound good, tour well, and, and everything to be uh, really as good as it can be for Chrissy. Right. I mean, she's she's the the head of the snake, this particular snake. So uh, it, it's all geared around Chrissy, of course, and um, that's the job, the platform. The band provides the platform to be the band because Chrissy then can then do what she has to do. That's that's the job. Team player, you're playing for the song. You're playing that's it. For the success of the unit. I love that. Mm -hmm. Like I said. Um, this is going to be part of my uh, recovery channel and, yeah. and purpose is just to, if there's anyone who's been in, in the same spot, any of their musicians or non-musicians who are like, 
down and out and they're like, I'm not getting anywhere. This is my new normal or whatever. I'm, I'm going to be showing tricks, um, little physical things that I do, um, improvements. Just And I tell little rock and roll stories. Like I have a green screen behind me and I pretend I'm in the Old West. And I say, this is the time that I met Morrissey and blah, blah, blah. Just like funny stuff. And then yeah. some interviews with heroes like yourself, you know, yeah. trying to get back to my origins. And um, this, I mean, automatically, like just the human energy, the, just the excitement of knowing I'd be able to talk to you is like the adrenaline, you know, I've already like my feet are faster. It's like, how does that happen? You know, it's like good. So yeah. thank you for sharing um, the time. And it's it's like it's already helped me. And that's what I want to pass along. Good. To people. Good. Well, here's to you. And here's to yeah. that Motorhead hoodie you're wearing. Motorhead God hoodie. I got to meet him once. In, yeah. in the hearing. <laughs> oh, he was a he was great fun in the early band when I first got to know him because he played the machines like Pete and I played the machines. So if I was out with Pete, I was mainly out with uh, Jimmy. But when I was out with Pete, we'd be playing all these games, asteroids and stuff. And then we got hit. Uh, in 79, 78 actually, but 79, we're in the studio recording. The Space Invader mm -hmm. was there. Right. So we have the song Space Invaders, another song I'd like to play. Who plays instrumentals these days? That's a great, Chrissy's got a great part, you know. And uh, just yeah, enjoy the you know. Chris's idea. The, the yeah, so it's, a, it's a pity we don't. I mean, if I got anything to do with it before we hang up the gloves, I think uh, it would be good to get back to some of those. I mean, I had the idea of just playing just the first album. Sure. People have done it. It's like, well, why not? Uh, but who I knows? Mean, Weezer's, Weezer's done it. We're just going to play our second record. You know, it's like, cool. Well, just imagine if we played the first album. We would start with a song we've always, in those early days, finished with. Yeah. We'd start with Precious. Start yeah. with Precious. Jesus, yes. Screaming out of the box. And I could still do it. I can still do those fucking songs the way I always did them. Yep. You know, there's nothing lacking. I can do all, everything that's going on. And yep. and that's the great thing. When I toured with, with Mott, and I, I said to them at the first, like, let's do more gigs. We're all up to speed, and we do five or six gigs in the same, the second tour in 2013. Yeah. Um, but... It's just a shame, you know, because you, you could, while you still can, you should. Are you playing with Dave Stewart at all these days? Or that was a... No, I haven't heard from Dave for a while. I play, I just did a thing for his birthday uh, a couple of years back, um, which was great fun. Um, just a, a big party, basically, but we all got on stage and everybody played, and um, yeah. that was good fun. So, uh, no, and I'm quite happy being here. I got a lot going on here. Building wise, um, building a summer seat, which is part hide and part summer seat. But I'm also going to live up there because it's underneath an oak tree. Sure. And um, I, I just can't get enough of uh, the real planet. Mm -hmm. A dangerous, dangerously positioned, breathing heavy planet. Yeah, I'm there. I'm in that same spot, too. I used to be like ignoring my surroundings i'm a lot more aware now a lot more appreciative and i'm trying to get more that way maybe if yeah. i can help some people it'll take me out of my selfishness and self-pity and all that stuff and just like give give you know yeah it helps to focus you you whatever your predicament is you're still here yeah. and it's still here so always keep and most people can't because they live in cities. They don't really think about nature much. They just make sure there's clean water coming out the tap, uh, that there's you flick the lights on and everything's warm enough and you've got a roof over your head. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to stop recording, but I, I want to say goodbye to you after that, if that's cool. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Martin. See you later. I was, oh, yeah, we'll do something when i got the book sorted or something. We'll talk about about a book or some of that would be great. See you again soon, I hope.